Greetings from International Pharmaceutical Federation. Welcome all. Welcome to all those who are joined us live and welcome to those who are joining us later on the Facebook. Thank you all for joining. And I would also like to warmly welcome all our guest panelists today, uh, whom I'll introduce shortly. Uh, we are all here for an exciting and interesting webinar on online pharmacy operations around the world. So welcome again, all the colleagues from all across the world. Myself, can I have a next slide, Susanna? Myself, I'll be chairing the session. I'm Mrs. Manjiri Gharat from uh, India. I'm the Vice President of International Pharmaceutical Federation and the Vice President of Indian Pharmaceutical Association and heading the Community Pharmacy Division of IPA. I'm a pharmacy academician and currently working as principal of the Kame Kundanani Pharmacy Polytechnic in the state of Maharashtra in India. Next slide, please, Susanna. Uh, I know most of you are connected to FIP, are part of FIP and have attended many of our digital events or FIP Congress. So you know FIP well, but let me introduce FIP again. Maybe some of you are first timers. So you know FIP is a global leader of pharmacy and it is uh, it, ha it represents more than 4 million pharmacists, pharmaceutical scientists, and pharmaceutical educators from all around the globe. FIP's region is a world where everyone benefits from access to safe, effective, uh, quality, and affordable medicines and the health technologies. FIP is on a mission to improve the global health and to support the advancement of pharmaceutical practice, sciences, and education. Uh, in the quest of FIP for advancing pharmacy worldwide, in September 2020, FIP has launched 21 FIP development goals to transform the global pharmacy. And these 21 FIP goals are from academic capacity. Can I have the next slide, Susanna? Uh, so these are the 21 goals. You can see some of you might be are already familiar with it. Uh, so these are the goals from academic capacity to sustainability in pharmacy. And today's webinar on online pharmacy operations is more linked or is connected to the development goal 18, which is on access to medicines, devices, and services. So what are we going to discuss? But let me tell you about the program. And we will have three eminent speakers, uh, Jaime Acosta from Spain, FIP CPS. He'll be talking on online pharmacies and distribution of medicine survey. What can we learn? So basically, he's going to tell you about the findings from FIP survey. Uh, Adi Bilzai from Sydney, Australia. He'll be talking on an overview of ethical implications for the delivery of medicines and pharmaceuticals online. Uh, Ukamaka Okafur will be talking about uh, country case studies for online pharmaceutical care services with angle on the self-care. And then we will have an interesting panel discussion and we would love to have many questions from our audience and we can put it in the question and answer box, QA box, and then there will be a wrap up conclusion and the take home messages. So before I take you to the first uh, talk by Jaime, uh, what are we going to discuss in this? So let me give you some background. All of you know that the technology which was first developed to facilitate the communication has now grown globally and formed so many networks and basically has created the interrelationship business between the businesses and the consumers. Implementing healthcare based on the information system and technologies has evolved. And you know, one of the best example is e-health. Provision of pharmaceutical services via the internet is an integral part of e-health. E-commerce e has become the norm of the day. Instead of making a trip to the store, all of us are used to buying various goods online at the click of the button, at the click of the mouse. And medicines could not remain an exception to this. But medicines are not like any other consumer goods. And so it causes a lot of concerns from ranging from say disruption of the existing pharmacy businesses to the most important concern that is patient safety. Some of the largest global e-commerce companies have shown that they have a robust supply chain to really disrupt the existing pharmaceutical supply chain. And definitely, naturally, pharmacists have responded with a lot of concern to these giants moving into the pharmacy and e-pharmacy market. 
So we are going to have some learning objectives in this webinar to address these issues. We will be discussing what are the strengths and weaknesses of the online pharmacies. Are there any threats? So like the brighter side of it, as well as the dark side of it, we'll be discussing. How do pharmacies operate in this online space in different countries? Because you can see a lot of variation in the operation modus operandi of these online pharmacies. How are they regulated in different countries? Can pharmacists take advantage of modern online marketplaces? Can we leverage on that? Does face-to-face -face interaction with the patient still make a difference when we are talking of online pharmacies? Is there an added value of online pharmaceutical care services compared to other e-commerce places? So we'll be addressing some of these issues. Uh, this webinar is being recorded and live streamed via Facebook. The recordings will be available on our website, www.fip.org. You can ask questions, as I told you earlier, through the question box, which is provided. You are welcome to provide the feedback to webinars at fip.org, which will help us to improve in the future. And I welcome you, I appeal you to become a, a member of FIP at the FIP website, www.fip.org slash membership underscore registration. Moving on to the first speaker uh, whom we have, Jaime Acosta. Uh, from FIP Community Pharmacy Section, Spain. Jaime is community pharmacist and a pharmacy owner in Madrid, Spain. He's a techno savvy person and he's a, no wonder he's the member of the FIP Technology Forum member. He's also a FIP COVID-19 Expert Advisory Group member and he's a comptroller at HeFame, he that is a Spanish drug wholesaler. He's the member of the governing Health Futures 2030, the Lancet and Financial Times Commission. Jaime has a strong passion for the future of pharmacy and deep understanding of the community pharmacist environment, environment and the ever-changing needs uh, of the healthcare. His leadership and skills have been awarded, have been recognized by World Health Organization in the past and recently by FIP and he has been awarded the FIP Fellow Award in 2020. He's the passionate community pharmacist. I'm very happy uh, to present before you Jaime Acosta. Welcome Jaime and thank you very much for accepting our invitation and to be the panelist here. So Jaime, it's uh, my pleasure to welcome you again and the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Manjiri. Uh, thank you, colleagues all over the world, from all over the world, for uh, investing some of your very valuable time to be with us uh, today. I will present you the most important findings of this uh, survey that the FIP has very recently uh, run. Uh, in the interest of time, I will get only in uh, some of uh, the findings uh, we saw, uh, analyzing the data, the preliminary data, and we hope that the report is uh, published on September. So uh, please have a look at the FIP social media and emails you will receive from FIP because you will receive the full analysis uh, then. Um, I would also like to say that I'm only a small part of the, uh, of the team that developed and is analyzing this survey. Uh, first of all, we have uh, our chair uh, today, Ms. Manjiri Garan, who very recently was uh, given a very important award in India just yesterday. Uh, uh, for her fight against uh, tuberculosis and leading pharmacy in, in that uh, very important fight. Congratulations, Manjiri. Uh, we have uh, Sari Westermark from Finland and of course, Mr. Lasuker Susenlund uh, from uh, Sweden. And I'm a very small part of the team and I have the honor to be with you uh, today. In the next slide, we'll um, uh, show you how this um, survey was organized. It's, uh, it's a project uh, from the community pharmacy section of the FIP that uh, has been uh, funded by the Board of uh, Pharmaceutical um, uh, Practice. Uh, it's part of it's a part of uh, biggest uh, survey that uh, FIP launched to uh, 146 FIP member organizations all, all um, around the world. Uh, it's a very technical and complex uh, survey, uh, and I would like to thank member organizations for taking the long time it has taken uh, them to answer the, sur the survey with so, so many details and uh, 
and technical information. So we had to include a glossary. Uh, we asked member organizations to provide us with a situation per country. So it was up to them when there were two or more member organizations in each country uh, to have a, a discussion about uh, what, what the, um, uh, who was going to answer the survey and send uh, uh, one single answer. Uh, it's very recent data because the survey closed in uh, February, uh, just a few weeks ago. Uh, and uh, FIP asked information on nine sections uh, related to community pharmacy, uh, regulation, ownership, scope of practice, remuneration, how is distribution of medicines run uh, in each country, and uh, what takes us uh, today, what brings us today, the online and digital operations. So now uh, it's up to the FIP to transform all that super big information that we have, so uh, so many details, to transform it in, into intelligence uh, to help uh, pharmacy advance as FIP does. Um, so as I said, it's a, a, a project funded by the uh, Board of Pharmaceutical Practice. Uh, the board handles all professional aspects of FIP's activities and facilitates collaboration between uh, practice sessions, community pharmacy, hospital, academia, military and emergency pharmaceutical industry. And uh, we uh, wanted to have a look at the um, operations related to online sales of medicines, especially regarding regulations, modus operandi, the effect on conventional pharmacies, uh, the challenges and legal regulatory requirements um, and enforcement for online pharmacies, which is very important. Uh, its effect on conventional pharmacies and patient safety, always with a progressive look. Uh, we think uh, that technology is always an opportunity to help pharmacies improve service. Uh, of course, it has some issues and challenges that need to be addressed, but uh, we have to be uh, in, in the times. and. Uh, uh, I think I personally think this this uh, can help pharmacy deliver a much better service and break the silos that we have now between uh, the delivery of products and the care. Uh, in the next slide, uh, I'll, let me show you uh, the answers we had. We had 80 uh, answers from around the world. Uh, of course, the majority of answers came from Europe because it's the region uh, with the biggest number of, of countries in it. Then we have Africa. Uh, Western Pacific and Americas, and last, uh, Southeast Asia and Eastern Mediterranean uh, region. Not because they are less engaged, they are super engaged uh, associations and uh, member organizations, but those are the regions with the least number of countries in the world. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, we asked uh, some uh, uh, different questions. I think this is one of the most important ones. Uh, uh, we, we want to know um, how the different categories of, of medicines, uh, non-prescription, prescription only, pharmacist only, specialty medicines uh, can be operated through different uh, channels. Uh, physical community pharmacy, internet pharmacies not linked to a physical pharmacy, uh, non-pharmacy suppliers as uh, druggist or online uh, generalist outlets as supermarkets. So uh, one of the first findings that we see is that uh, all the categories of medicines uh, is mostly authorized by existing community pharmacies. Um, and uh, the second uh, biggest uh, number of uh, answers, uh, normally uh, prescription only, pharmacist only, and specialty medicines are simply not allowed to be operated through the internet. And uh, except for the case of non-prescription, uh, which is made available to patients and customers uh, uh, through online generalist outlets as supermarkets after uh, physical community pharmacies. In the next slide, I uh, wanted to show you this, what I think is a very important, uh, very recent report because if we want to have a safe and um, uh, supply uh, with efficacy of medicines, we have to provide care at the same time. And uh, here I put you this QR code to this uh, digital health in pharmacy education report because uh, it was a, a big survey run by FIP very recently. And there we show not only aspects about how uh, pharmacists and pharmacy students are being educated in, 
in digital health, which I think is a very important matter, but also uh, we scanned how different digital health technologies are being used currently in, uh, in uh, pharmacy practice. Not only community pharmacy, of course, community pharmacy, but also hospital pharmacy and other, and other um, um, practice settings. Um, next slide, please. We uh, asked uh, about the chance of using uh, electronic prescriptions by uh, these online pharmacies. E-prescribing is a prescriber's ability to electronically send an accurate, error-free and understandable prescription directly to a pharmacy from the point of care. It is an important element in improving the quality of patient care. The benefits include enhanced patient safety, reduced drug costs, increased access to patient prescription records and uh, improved pharmacy workflow. And you can see that still uh, not all the countries uh, have uh, e-prescriptions uh, in use or allowed. Uh, still 42% of the countries that answered the survey do not have uh, e-prescriptions yet in their jurisdictions. In the next slide, uh, we um, asked them uh, when uh, prescription medicines could be delivered uh, through internet sales. Uh, we asked them how do patients or customers uh, um, give that prescription, send that pr prescription uh, to the internet pharmacy. And we have a 28% that uh, use um, electronic prescriptions. 18% uh, uh, customers or patients upload uh, the images of prescriptions. 10% uh, of the internet pharmacies allow or require, in some cases, those prescriptions to be delivered to the pharmacy. Or in some cases, the patient uh, was assessed uh, through automatic uh, questionnaires. Uh, the 34% that we have in the other uh, is mostly related to uh, uh, countries at which prescription medicines could not be sold through the internet or it was only limited to non-prescription medicines. In the next slide, uh, we asked uh, respondents about the systems that it's in place to verify the authenticity of uh, prescriptions if it wasn't an e-prescription. Um, so uh, in 28% of the countries, uh, internet pharmacies verify the prescriber from a list of registered practitioners. 12% uh, the responsibility relies solely on the uh, patient. And uh, we have uh, almost 60% of other answers and we have very different uh, systems in place. For example, in some countries, it's entirely up to the pharmacist uh, to verify the prescription once uploaded into the pharmacy system. Uh, in some other countries, prescriptions uh, can be pre-ordered, but then uh, they have to be delivered to a pharmacy uh, so the patient can pick up uh, his or her medicine. And it's in that moment when the prescription is verified. In other countries, uh, it's the uh, deliverer personal who receives the prescription and in that case verifies the prescription or uh, in other countries, uh, the prescribers send a direct email to the, uh, to the pharmacy, to the dispenser. In the next slide, we asked about uh, the electronic health record, which is a very important piece of information uh, to assess uh, patients and the drugs, uh, they are um, going to be dispensed or sold. An electronic health record is a digital version of a patient's paper chart. Uh, they are uh, real-time patient-centered records that make information available instantly and securely to authorized users. While they do contain the medical and treatment histories of patients, it is built to go beyond standard clinical data collected in a provider's office and can be inclusive of a broader view of uh, a patient's care. Electronic health records can contain, of course, a patient's medical history, but also diagnosis, medications, treatment plans, immunization dates, which is super important now with the COVID pandemic. And now that fortunately we are uh, providing vaccinations to the arms of, of patients at last. Also allergies, radiology images, laboratory and test results, and much more information. They allow, also allow access to evidence-based tools that providers can use to make decisions about a patient's care. For example, automatic tools to detect potential interactions between the medicines and automate and streamline the provider workflow. 
One of the key features of an electronic health record is that health information can be created and managed by authorized providers in a digital format capable of being shared with other providers across more than one healthcare organization. They are built to share information with other healthcare providers and organizations as pharmacists and pharmacists. So they contain information from all clinicians involved in patient care. Pharmacists, of course, provide care to patients across the healthcare continuum and should be active participants in the electronic health record, seeking and documenting information. It is imperative that pharmacists' workflow and information needs are met within electronic health records to optimize medication therapy quality and patient outcomes. While pharmacists use many different advanced functions in the electronic health record, the literature describes three main uses, documentation, medication reconciliation, and patient evaluation and monitoring. But uh, having said that, and being so important uh, for pharmacists to have access, not only uh, reading the electronic health record, but also writing it, uh, and I'll get into that in a few seconds, still the majority of countries do not allow um, pharmacists to access information in the health record at all. And I think it's a shame because how, how can we assess uh, patients in those cases, uh, not only uh, to assessing patients about his or her medicines, but also patient safety aspects of the importance of an allergy or a pregnancy, it really uh, blows my mind. Uh, in some other countries, 23% uh, of, uh, of countries, uh, pharmacists are allowed to have access to only a part of the patient's health records. In only 1.6% um, of the countries, pharmacists have access to the full electronic health record. And in other countries, 3% of pharmacists have an access to the summary of all the information uh, provided in the electronic health record. I wanted to show you in the next slide the information about uh, the writing um, ability of uh, pharmacists into these electronic health records. Uh, in 2019, the FIP Working Group on Non-Communicable Diseases conducted a survey of all FIP member organizations and they published their findings in this, this very interesting record, which I encourage you to download and read it because it's also very interesting. So for those countries where community pharmacies do have reading access to a part of the full content, content of the electronic health record, the survey investigated the possibility of pharmacists registering their interventions and disease screening findings in this electronic health record, finding that in 35% of territories, pharmacies may introduce data and interventions on the electronic health record. So it's a double thing we would, patients need us to do, not only reading the information about them, but also putting into the system the specific information that as pharmacists, we can put to other healthcare providers and the patient themselves. I think this is very important too. In the next slide, um, we also asked uh, uh, countries about the regulation, if they had uh, some specific regulation in their jurisdictions. And this was surprising uh, to me because uh, the major majority, just a slight majority, but still uh, too, high enough, too high enough for my uh, previous understanding of what we were going to find, 50% of countries still do not have dedicated laws to internet pharmacies in their country. I think this will uh, increase, uh, keep increasing, uh, also because of the push that the COVID pandemic uh, has uh, uh, done uh, to e-commerce and online sales of products, including many times uh, uh, drugs, which of course are not regular products and need uh, specific stewardship by pharmacists. In the next slide, uh, we asked also uh, about um, how could uh, patients, customers identify if the website they were uh, buying or getting their medicine was uh, legal? Uh, because as we all know, uh, internet is the biggest uh, channel for uh, fake medicines uh, delivery. And uh, it's a full, sadly, a full important industry throughout the world. Uh, and 37% uh, of the countries do not have established uh, any established method. 32% uh, of the countries, the customer or the patient can verify the, the online pharmacy from uh, 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 registered in a, in a list available online. 
uh, or um, almost 9% percent of the countries, there's a special authentication website for internet pharmacies available. Uh, and uh, we had also many different uh, answers apart from uh, these three previous ones that I have mentioned. For example, in Europe, there's a um, uh, legal website for internet uh, sale of medicines that uh, has to have a uh, logo uh, that is different from uh, country to country in the European Union. Uh, so uh, patients know when they access this uh, internet pharmacy with this logo, they know that it's a real uh, legal pharmacy. Or in some other countries, for example, only brick and mortar pharmacies are allowed to sell medicines through the internet. So patients can be referred to those websites specifically from the pharmacy when they visit one. In the next slide, uh, we uh, asked uh, member organizations if they were aware of uh, irresponsible self-medication uh, through internet purchase by consumers. Uh, still almost 55% uh, can uh, do not have uh, enough data, but I think this should be pretty worrying. 25% uh, uh, of member organizations say that yes, and it's quite often. Uh, and they uh, mentioned specifically uh, cannabis products, CBD products, slimming pills, esteroids, sildenafil, emergency contraceptives, codeine, her treatment products, antibiotics, etc. And uh, we also had a number of uh, answers uh, referring us to information about uh, patients uh, selling their own medicines through the internet. Uh, through secondhand uh, online internet uh, markets or even social media. Uh, we were said that in some cases, patients use Facebook, especially to sell uh, the leftovers uh, that they had uh, from previous treatments. And I think this is a huge challenge for regulators and the internet companies that are um, uh, managing this uh, website. Uh, next slide, please. We also asked about uh, uh, discounts and publicity of uh, internet pharmacies. And 39% uh, of respondents said that uh, discounts were not allowed to internet pharmacies, but 43% uh, of uh, countries say that in their jurisdictions, internet pharmacies are allowed to advertise themselves or the uh, discounts uh, they can make to patients. Next slide, please. Uh, and also because internet uh, does not have uh, frontiers between countries, we asked if uh, there's regulation in place that prevent internet pharmacies from operating, uh, operating from, uh, uh, from foreign country. And uh, we had a very big answer uh, towards uh, uh, these pharmacies are not allowed to, to sell, to operate medicines in uh, different countries apart from their own jurisdictions. And uh, the next slide. To finish, um, uh, this is the last slide. Uh, please, uh, as I said, uh, we will advertise the final findings on the, on the, that the report is published in September. Uh, and uh, I just wanted to bring your attention to the FIP position statement about emerging technologies and pharmacy practice, which is very interesting. And also to the community pharmacy section document on the vision 2020 and 2025. There's a lot of information there if you're interested in digital health and um, online sales of medicines. And uh, I hope you have the chance of having a look at it. This was all from me for the moment. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Jaime. Uh, it was an exhaustive presentation of the survey uh, done recently by FIP and very interesting findings, uh, how the online pharmacy operations right from regulations differ from country to country. Thank you very much. Now we move on to the next presenter and that is Adi Mirzai from University of Sydney, uh, Australia. Uh, Adi is community pharmacist, uh, but has passion for research and he's doing PhD in health information seeking behavior. Uh, he has special skills in machine learning, deep learning and data science. Uh, he's a state intern training coordinator and a member of FIP technology forum member. And he's a member of FIP's health and medicines information section. So 
uh, Ardi, thank you very much for joining and accepting our invitation. And uh, he is, I present to you Ardi, who is a, a very dedicated community pharmacist having passion for the research in area of health information and community pharmacy. Welcome uh, Ardi, it's all yours. Thank you for that uh, introduction. Um, and yes, welcome to the rest of the world. Um, I hope you guys can hear me okay. Um, so yeah, I'll be speaking to you uh, about some of the ethical implications um, of the delivery of medications coming from an online uh, perspective. Um, and I'll, I'll start off by showing a bit about what the internet and you know, what the state of the online pharmacy is. So obviously talking about online, it's heard and we talk about the internet. Um, and we know from like 1960s, we had the introduction of um, ARPANET, which was a protocol used for communications. And we've seen growth since then. The 80s, we had edu, uh, .edu, .gov, and .com. So the common domain names uh, that we see used uh, in this day and age. Um, we then had the 90s where we had companies like Google, Amazon, eBay, big companies that we have today being established and started. And even the way we use the internet through HTML uh, being established. 2010s, you know, the 10s we saw virtual assistants, AI driven uh, shopping and a computerized um, marketplace. And what does the future hold? Well, we know 20 um, going next, 2020 was a year of <laughs> unprecedented times. Um, and many have seen, um, may have seen the expansion of, you know, working from home, remote learning and education. And, you know, this re leading to a rapid rise in online delivery or delivery to the home. So with, with this growth, who knows what's in store for the next 50 years. So moving on, we have uh, just a snapshot about what the internet is like right now. You yourself are using the internet, your patients are using the internet and they use it to purchase their medications. So what are the common ways that people might be purchasing these medications? So I'll talk about a few different uh, models uh, that kind of exist. So the first model um, moving on is the mail order pharmacies. Now it's warranted I mentioned this first uh, before talking about some of the online pharmacies because internet pharmacies have some of the principles based on mail order pharmacies. So mail order pharmacists have a similar role to traditional bricks and mortar pharmacists. They, um, they, you know, their difference is they might interact without a customer or a patient face-to-face -face interactions. So they receive orders via mail, email, fax, or phone order. They are then prepared accordingly and dispatched via mail to a patient. All manner of health checks are done and conducted uh, as well. And maybe the medication is labeled in a similar way you would do in a uh, traditional pharmacy. Uh, if the patient requires further instructions, um, they can communicate with the pharmacist or get in touch with a pharmacist. Now, these aren't new developments. These have been around for a while, um, but their expansion has been slightly different to how internet pharmacies have been. Now, I make this difference, and I want to make a difference between mail order pharmacies and internet pharmacies. The main is that online pharmacies uh, and mail order pharmacies, though they might share some common uh, functions, uh, they, um, they do have one different thing. Um, that being online pharmacies operate like a drugstore online where patients can go and shop for medications that they might need. Whereas a mail order pharmacy may be part of a insurance company's distribution network. Now, some may think mail order pharmacies and online pharmacies do the exact same thing. And this is, can be true. Uh, this ex specific example of the difference might be more relevant to maybe countries with insurance systems like the United States. Um, but to set a basis of def uh, definitions, I um, thought I would make the difference between mail order and online pharmacies. So moving on, we have the first type of online pharmacy is your traditional bricks and mortar pharmacy with an online presence. These pharmacies can provide a reach uh, to patients uh, by providing the supply of medications online, as well as having a physical location for patients to visit. Some mail out the medication, others provide a click and collect option where the patients can order online and come into the pharmacy and collect it. 
So others are extending beyond these four walls of the pharmacy and having a social media presence where they can connect to the, uh, where the patients can connect to a pharmacist and the pharmacy. They can chat to a pharmacist via the phone or messaging system, and they know who the pharmacist on the other side is. The pharmacy sometimes run a health promotion using social media um, as its platform. The primary business of this type of online pharmacy is that there is a physical venue that drives their business. So in contrast to the next one, which is online only uh, pharmacies, the online only uh, pharmacy is, as the name says, online only. There is no physical or front of shop location. There may be a warehouse or where items are shipped from. Um, however, this is not used for the sale of uh, products. If a patient wishes to, uh, they can contact the pharmacy and the pharmacy can contact the patient if need to, for, a for example, in the first time using a medication. The pharmacy still requires a prescription in order to prepare the medication, um, but not only supplying medication, they may provide other items like household items, vitamins, or even alternative products. So most online pharmacy businesses that are like this are registered legitimate businesses. So these two online pharmacies described are legal businesses. And as Raimi had shown in the survey, if a country has legislated the sale and use of medicines, through different means, as opposed to solely physical means, these types of pharmacies can be found. And usually in legislating these pharmacies, a legally qualified pharmacist is involved. Now we might go to the other side where, you know, though we have legitimate pharmacy services, pharmacist services, we might have some that, you know, operate outside a country's laws. And ethical adherence to these laws are, you know, usually based on their country's organizational guidelines. These are some of, some of these websites could be rogue pharmacy websites. So these websites violate professional, legal, and ethical standards and can at times endanger the patient's safety. They may be located in a different country other than the one where the order is coming from. And may they not be registered in either country either. They might have you know, fake contact details. And if you do try to contact them, it might have an invalid email address or phone number. Some may offer a prescription free uh, service Others may offer you a quick consult, which is only a questionnaire. And if you really want the medication, you'll answer in the way to get the medications, to get the medication accordingly. If the products do arrive, they could be fake, expired, or of poor quality. So if a website, and I'm putting it to you guys, is offering medication without a prescription, is that legal or ethical? Who is making the diagnosis in this case? What was the medical care of diagnosis that was provided? Does the sole use of a completed questionnaire mean a thorough history has been gathered? Or is, is a pharmacist being involved at all? The final model that I want to show next is the dark web. Now, um, accessibility for legitimate reasons can be done uh, for medications if there's medical supervisions. The dark web, um, most people might associate this with an illegal activity. Now, why am I mentioning it today as part of online pharmacies? Well, there is an illegal drug trade and this is worth about $36 trillion. The dark web is an area where you know, illegal drug activity does occur. It also does occur in the normal surface part of the world. Uh, we do can find illegal drug sales on the surface web, but this is another place where people might go. So the dark web sits behind layers of encryption and security, which gives users privacy to navigate it anonymously. Now, this can be good for, say, journalists and lawyers who might need to do some research or share things anonymously. You know, we had the case of um, WikiLeaks where things were shared anonymously. But this anonymity is also granted to suppliers and users of drugs or medications. Now, I assume we can all agree that the sale of medication is unethical and illegal without due medical professional consultation. However, what is involved for the individual user of these services? Well, you know, it might be providing access to medications that are normally not available in some countries. This can be medications that are not controlled by any regulations such as FDA, EMA, or TGA. You know, it might allow for access to greater patented. There is no, but there is no guarantee of safety or quality. I did meet, uh, I had a lovely patient once who, you know, she claimed to me, she was telling me that she had bought medication off the dark web, some experimental drug, and it was helping her with a depression. Now, why weren't many registered medications helping her, but this experimental drug did? Now, 
do we do we now we got to think to ourselves do we refuse treatment to patients because they find something that works and this always brings us to the classical case of medical marijuana you know if this treatment is helping a patient what is our position how do we help our patients now this is as grandiose as it might sound it is not always commonly the case where it might be used for uh, health activities where more often than not people might be using it in legit illegitimate ways so the websites that I mentioned um, as a summary of them, we had the mail order pharmacies, bricks and mortars with online presence, online pharmacy pharmacies, rogue websites, um, and the illegal drug trade on uh, the dark web. So going on, and so going on, we have, we, we have to think as a pharmacist is involved in some of these conditions, maybe in the legitimate cases of legitimate uh, pharmacies, how, as a pharmacist, what is our interaction with this in internet, quote unquote? So looking at the fifth statement of you know, professional standards and the code of ethics for pharmacists, you know, this is a document from 2014 at in Bangkok, um, they set some boundaries or some guidance for us pharmacists into interacting appropriately with um, as a part of our ethics. Um, as far as I've gathered, and my personal understanding of this, legitimate online pharmacies use the services of a qualified pharmacist. Hence, they are subject to the code of ethics. But I pose, um, I pose these questions to you guys. You know, in the concept of disrepute, are the pharmacists and pharmacy businesses interacting in a way that is affecting the reputation of the pharmacy or pharmacy industry? Are we acting with honesty, integrity? How do we maintain that with the patient? In terms of safety, what safety checks are the pharmacists doing? Do they dispense and ship a medication or do they gather a proper history? In professionalism, do you maintain professionalism when you do not see the patient? Do you need to see the patient to be professional? If there is a change in dose, an incorrect dose, a change in drug, who does the pharmacy contact? Do you reject a prescription by information of the patient, by, uh, by how, the patient if, how the patient provides that information to you? And finally, in confidentiality, are systems in place to ensure information is not leaked or breached? How certain are you that who you have in front of you or on the phone is the patient or the carer? What are your checking mechanisms? The online pharmacies I've mentioned and the legitimate pharmacies um, providing, are currently providing services to patients. And in terms of legality, they are abiding by the laws of the countries they reside and serve the residents of the country that are there. Therefore, legally, they are okay. Ethically, it's up to the pharmacists to see how they interact. We have a duty to provide information services. And some guidelines recommend not only what is said, but also how it is said. And part of the requirement is paying attention to the patient's nonverbal cues. Can you do effective um, communication via phone or text? On the opposite side, are all patients confident to share face-to-face, -face, having a medium between them and the pharmacist and patient? Will that allow them to speak more freely and openly when the patient assumes a normality? I don't ask these questions because I have the answers, <laughs> but I pose them uh, in order to allow pharmacists and those interacting these uh, considering these avenues to see if they're meeting their duties as pharmacists. Uh, moving on, I think it's warranted uh, that I highlight sort of the, you know the pandemic that we had last year because this was an era where patients required medical services remotely the most. Medication access became an important point as many people couldn't venture from their homes, but a great time as well for great misinformation spread. As patients are spending more and more time online, they're absorbing more and more information, which can at times be incorrect information. And we see this definitely the case with certain vaccinations and vaccination hesitancy. So going next, what is the role of the pharmacist in this? Well, we need to be educated about where patients go. We need to understand the motivations of a patient and be able to help guide their search journey. We have to be building the skills of patients to effectively navigate this landscape of the internet. If they present to you with a website or a query, how do you mitigate it? How do you help them? Are you balancing your legal and ethical duties when a patient comes to you for advice? Before I finish, I want to tell you a story about a young patient I had uh, who came to me asking about illicit use of steroids. I gave him my disclaimer that I don't support his use but proceeded to explain the problems he may notice and the medical advice he has to seek. 
he is already using the swords. He couldn't undo that. But we can educate him on further use. And if he's experiencing problems, then we tackle them early on. Now, he was thankful to me, not because of my advice, but because I was the first healthcare professional to provide him judgment-free advice. And for him, that was a world of help. So thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Adi, for this wonderful presentation and bringing different aspects and different types of pharmacy and letting us know about the operations of these pharmacies from mail order to the online mode. And also uh, discussing about the role of pharmacists during COVID. Um, and uh, you clearly brought up uh, the issue of the, I mean, the dark side of the internet pharmacies. So thank you very much for this lucid presentation. And I'm sure people have a lot of questions for you. Now we move on to the next panelist and that is Ukamaka Okafor uh, from Nigeria. Welcome Ukamaka and thank you for joining. Uh, she's uh, the director of Lagos Zonal Office, coordinator of supply chain and logistics project management uh, unit. And uh, that is from Pharmacist Council of Nigeria. Ukamaka is a global health strategist and distinguished medicine regulator and logistic and supply chain management expert with over 30 years of post-qualification experience. She's a fellow of the West African Postgraduate College of Pharmacists. She's an associate editor. Uh, in, she's an, in the editorial panel of FIP's Pharmacy Education Journal. Uh, she's the voluntary tutor, project supervisor, and external assessor for thesis at Faculty of Public Health. West African Postgraduate College of Pharmacists, and she is a certified researcher. She has many prestigious certificates in supply chain management from Massachusetts, just to name few, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, Commonwealth Pharmacist Association, UNDP program, and she's a grantee of BMGF, uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Kids Foundation, FIP, and many more. Okamaka, happy to have you, and the floor is yours. Thank you. She's going to discuss about the country case studies yeah. for online pharmacy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, afternoon, everybody. This afternoon, we're talking about the country case studies for online pharmaceutical services with special attention to self care and online pharmacy. So, in the next slides, I've disclosed my interest, my disclosure that um, the views I'm expressing are, are mine and not those of my employers or any other person. And then the, this is the outline of the presentation. And uh, in this uh, presentation, we are going to be talking about the introduction, the background. We explain what online pharmacy is. And then we talk about some uh, cases in some countries, then the benefits. And we also try to relate self-care to online pharmaceutical services. And uh, I want to... Uh, inform you that we have selected these countries based on FIP regional forum. So we have tried to go to each of the FIP regional fora and selected one or two countries to talk about them. So the next slide you'll be seeing what is online or internet pharmacy. My other colleagues have explained this. And it's a web page that advertises or dispenses and sells medicines or other health products. So in all over the world, in many countries, we have both legitimate and illegitimate, illegitimate, uh, illegitimate sales of online pharmaceutical products. And we also have independent internet-only sites, like branches of brick and mortar pharmacies, and also sites representing partnership and aggregate of uh, pharmacies. All of them fall under the purview of online pharmacies. So in that next slide, we're talking about the background, because FIP, in response to WHO activities and what is also happening in the world concerning the technology disruption, in 2019, introduced what we call the Technology Forum. And the forum was uh, developed or instituted to provide guidance for FIP members on digital uh, activities. So this launch of the Technology Forum was also a follow-up of what the uh, WHO has done in April 2019. So in the next slide, we're talking about, as I told you, we are talking about uh, selected case countries. 
So we're talking about USA in USA, estimate of 30 to 50,000 online transactions have taken place in US. And many of these transactions in the United States are not even within the US. Some of them are, are registered in, uh, and maybe from Russia, China, India, but they sell their products in US, just like uh, road pharmacies. Then in US, there is no national uh, licensing of pharmacies, but pharmacies are licensed both for online and offline at their state levels. So the US uh, law has uh, online registration for different states. So for you to be licensed, you have to fulfill the standards of that particular state where you want to practice, whether you are online or offline. But in the United Kingdom, just like in many, and in Italy, in the next slide, we're talking about online pharmacy in um, UK and uh, in Italy. In UK, online pharmacy has been there since uh, 2005, and uh, there is a um, online pharmacy for prescriptions and OTCs. And the UK law allows you to fill prescriptions online. But in Italy, Italy online uh, pharmacy is not restricted to only over the counter. There is no online pharmaceutical services that is approved for prescription products in Italy. So any sort of prescription products in Italy cannot be done online. It must be done by uh, physical pharmacies. And in the next slide, we're talking about the Canadian internet pharmacy. A licensed pharmacy selling drugs online must be a website of a brick and mortar pharmacy with a physical address in Canada. There is no national licensure of online pharmacies in Canada, but all the pharmacies in Canada, both offline and online, are registered in line with the standards of the particular province in Canada and not a national law. So in Canada, they have a logo, this only logo. And this logo is supposed to be on any site of a pharmacy that is registered online, no matter the state where that uh, pharmacy is. Then uh, uh, outside Canada, we also want to talk about, in the next slide, the online pharmacies in Egypt, India, Indonesia, and Korea. There is no form of online pharmaceutical services in any um, Korean territory, but in Indonesia, only uh, licensed offline pharmacies are allowed to establish e pharmacy. So, for you to have an e-pharmacy in Indonesia, the physically existing. Then in India, the e-pharmacy started in 2013. They were challenged by some issues and some laws um, and some legal issues until 2019, when the online pharmacy bounced back in India. And to date, online pharmacy has been. Uh, in existence in India. In the next uh, uh, slide, I'll, I'll, I'll come back home to talk about the online pharmacy in Nigeria. Online pharmacy in Nigeria is speedily growing and embraced by the public, despite the absence of a legal framework to, uh, uh, to regulate it. Illegal online sales of medicines exist in some states of the federation, and they constitute major disruption with ethical and regulatory challenges in the country. Various models of internet pharmacy exist in Nigeria, some of them are extensions of licensed community pharmacy, like V3 drugs and uh, RS online pharmacy. There are extensions of already existing and ethically practicing pharmacies in Nigeria, while others are aggregates of uh, different community pharmacies that are licensed by the Pharmacy Council of Nigeria, but they've been brought into aggregation by uh, uh, people like Kings.com. Those are also doing a uh, bet. For now, there is no law to, to regulate them, though the law is already uh, uh, being processed. But because of the things that we, we know all over the world now, people are already doing self-care. And there's a huge uh, correlation between self-care and online pharmacy services. Uh, talking about self-care, self-care is any action or activity that individuals or community do to protect their health with or without the support of a healthcare provider. So it's ability to maintain or improve one's health. So in Nigeria, because of the the clear circumstances that are happening all over the world, pharmacies are, are already addressing and resolving self-care queries through various platforms. And there are pharmacies are also making referrals to other health institutions when need be. So the huge uh, relationship that exists between self-care and pharmaceutical services have uh, heightened, that heightened the, the prevalence of uh, self-care and online uh, uh, pharmaceutical services in the country. 
So in the next uh, slide, uh, we're talking about the, the, that relationship. Because in Nigeria, the prevalence of self-care has been heightened by lockdown and movement restrictions. Because we've always had have, have self-care and online medicine. But its rate has increased because of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And people are afraid of even going to the health facilities. There was also lockdown at a, at a time. And due to the lockdown and the movement restrictions, people have, uh, have begun to embrace widely self-care and online pharmacy services. Unfortunately, this has led to the increasing number of nursing outlets and illegal online pharmacy services, some of which may be dealing on counterfeit and falsified medicines. But for now, a new pharmacy bill has been sponsored by the Pharmacy Council of Nigeria, where I work. And uh, this pharmacy bill is supposed to address the, the online pharmacy regulation. This bill now is waiting the approval for the Honorable Minister of Health and the President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. And we are hoping that in a, in a very short time, this bill will be signed so that uh, the online pharmacy in Nigeria will come under proper regulation. So in the next slide, I'll be talking about the benefits of online pharmaceutical services. We all know that online pharmaceutical services have a lot of benefits, despite its uh, setback. There is increased access to health care and pharmaceutical care. There are some places that are underserved, underreached, and uh, on, on um, how to reach areas. In, in those places, because of the online present, uh, presence of vascular activities in Nigeria, there is increased access to healthcare to those people. All the news and crannies of Nigeria now, because of social media, internet that is everywhere, people can access pharmacy services anywhere they are. And that's one of the great advantage of online pharmacy. There is also privacy and confidentiality. Some patients are shy and they may not want people to know what they're suffering from or what they're buying. And that is why that our records have shown that uh, sex enhancers have become the highest number of products that are that are ordered online. And that is show that people want privacy and confidentiality. They don't want to go to the community pharmacy or to the hospital to get self, uh, sex enhancers. And because they are uh, practicing self-care, they order such uh, products online. So, a benefit of online is a privacy and confidentiality. And then in the next slide, we're talking about more benefits. Because pharmacies are now at the core of patient care. Because of online pharmacy, pharmacies can take lead, you know, in the patient care process through virtual counseling and consultations. It also saves logistics costs for the patients as medicines can be delivered to them in their homes and in the working places. Then the online pharmacy also supports the government policy of infection prevention, and control, such as the COVID-19 pandemic, and also even for the elderly patients that, that are at, at greatest risk. Online pharmacy has afforded them the opportunity of getting their medicines without going to the health facility. It has also improved adherence to prescriptions, especially for chronically ill persons, because people can now automatically order their products periodically, and at, at periodic uh, uh, intervals, they get their products automatically because they've been ordered uh, online. Then uh, in the next slide, we're talking about disadvantages of the online pharmacy and the, uh, the, 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 the benefits of online pharmacy also. It guarantees access to safe and efficacious genuine medications. Because you know that in some rural areas, you may have uh, medicines that are, that are not very genuine or falsified in some rural areas. But due to online pharmacies, anywhere you are in Nigeria, you can get very safe and genuine medications. And there's also an improved uh, social image for the pharmacy profession, because social media has made the online pharmacy very popular and people have known that pharmacists can actually talk to them online and do some ethical practices and also promote the profession. So the online uh, pharmacy uh, practice has improved greatly the social image of the pharmacy in Nigeria. It's also time saving because it has reduced the burden of their traveling and then the waiting time in some pharmacies where there is a densely populated communities. You don't need to go there to wait for the for your products. And also the reduced overhead costs. Because uh, before the online pharmacy became very popular, people are having many branches in different places. But now pharmacies can uh, operate from one, but only one branch. And then with online pharmacies, uh, reach all their patients without having to open branches wherever all their patients are living. So having spoken about the benefits and the importance of the online pharmacy, we need to talk about the recommendation. We need to talk about the disadvantages. In the next slide, we talk about what is the disadvantage of online pharmacy. 
So despite all the advantages, online pharmacies still have their own its own uh, shortfalls. Online sales of medicines may lead to regulatory challenges since some people can run online pharmacy outside the country. Just like what I've explained before, you find people running online pharmacies from Russia, from Turkey, from China into other countries that are outside their boundaries. And because of the ease of sale and handling of medicines online, especially for those that are running illegal online um, medicine stores online, it can lead to drug abuse and misuse. Because it also patient data and uh, data uh, may be lost, you know, because of uh, on some online platforms that are not uh, strictly adhered to. Then, what is the importance of face to face patient interaction? For face to face patient interaction, despite the fact that online pharmacies has a lot of uh, a lot of advantages, we also know that there are some there are some interactions that you cannot do with online. Something like taking the weight of your patient, taking the height, the blood pressure, BMI, uh, doing IPSS score, IEF5 assessment, some of these uh, things can be uh, uh, are very, very uh, easy done face to face and not online because you cannot check BMI, you cannot check weight, you cannot check height online. So that's why the fact that we have uh, online pharmacies all over the world, there are still need for face-to-face -face patient interaction. And also, it can give room for to identify nonverbal communication. When you are talking to a patient online, you may not be able to know what the person is saying nonverbally. But when the patient is in front of you, you can decode what the patient is talking about, even when you have not said it. It also promotes a, a, a pharmacy patient interaction and also objective assessment. Then in the next uh, slide, we're talking about recommendations for effective regulation. Digital health interventions, including online physical care, are not sufficient on their own. Therefore, there is need to ensure online pharmacies have physical outlets due to persons that may need thorough investigation and physical assessment, and for also tracking and tracing the operators of the pharmacy. So there is need for all online pharmacies to also have a physical presence of their pharmacy so that you can track them, you can trace the operators when there is need. Also, consumers need to be educated about the need to, to know that there are genuine and uh, non-genuine online service, service providers. So we need to also train our, uh, our consumers so that they can avoid sites that sell drugs without authorized healthcare practitioner. Then the government should also provide policies and models and guidelines that will guide online pharmaceutical services in order to maintain their standards. Because if there are no standards and policies and models, you know, to regulate the online practice of a uh, pharmacy, then people are going to be taking drugs from illegal uh, places online, and that might endanger their health. So, having said that, we want to conclude because we are talking about how what pharmacies can do. How can pharmacies, you know, protect themselves in this online marketplace? So, as a conclusion, the advent of COVID-19 pandemic has changed the way people do things, and my school sector should not be left out. Pharmacies must upskill themselves, position themselves in the online marketplace, and be at the front burner to provide the pharmaceutical needs of the public, both virtually and physically. It is hoped that pharmacies and pharmaceutical systems should develop adequate capacities to take their place in the online space without compromising the integrity of pharmaceutical care. Where there are no concrete policies for internet-based pharmaceutical services, like in many countries, there is urgent need for pharmacy regulators to propose and adopt temporary measures, models, and guidelines while defining policies for e-pharmacy, particularly in this pandemic era, in order to safeguard the health of the public. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you These so are my much. References. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kamaka. That was uh, excellent presentation, and thank you for taking us around uh, the globe in different continents to let us know how the pharmacies operate. And thank you for highlighting the advantages and disadvantages of the online pharmacy. Thanks for highlighting also the face to importance of face to face interaction. And I like to a conclusion saying that pharmacists must upskill themselves. So like try, they should try to adapt to the changing technologies. So thank you all the panelists, all the three panelists for your wonderful presentations. And it is the now it is time now for the panel discussion and we are overwhelmed with many questions. So I would like to take uh, some of these questions and starting with uh, one question uh, is how to start the online pharmacies in a country 
where the pharmacies are mostly regarded as individual businesses, like their single owned, individual owned brick and mortar pharmacies. So how can one start uh, the online pharmacy operations? Because uh, now the, as the world is changing, we can see more of online pharmacies competing with the physical pharmacies. So is there any scope? Can you suggest uh, how the pharmacies can start their online operations? Uh, I would first like to go to Jaime, please. Can you answer that? Would you be happy? Yes, of course. Uh, I am an independent uh, pharmacy owner and I have gone through the pains of trying to build my own uh, website uh, for product uh, for selling products, uh, and I've spent a lot of money, uh, which uh, lately was an successful uh, development, because it's it's pretty complex to upload uh, to to have the the digital store uh, upload all the products, have them updated, the pictures, um, uh, the process of delivering to the customer. Uh, the uh, uh, receiving the money from the customer it's pretty complex and uh, difficult especially when we have to to also keep managing our own businesses so in my own personal example as an independent uh, pharmacy owner uh, I've accepted the offer from my wholesaler Fame, who developed a store for all their customers and they run uh, the um, um, back office for us uh, so it's very smooth for us and we can focus on, on patient care. Uh, that's my example. It's uh, going to the right partners and not trying to do everything by yourselves, which is, as in my understanding, impossible as an independent pharmacy owner. That's my answer. Yeah, that's very nice practical approach. Thank you, Jaime. So you are an independent, uh, we are having an independent pharmacy with added value, I mean, added online services, right? So uh, would uh, Adi or Ukamaka, would you like to add anything to this? To the same question, how can an individual independent pharmacy uh, start their own online pharmacies? I'm sure, of course, there has to be a legal backing, a legal framework to do yeah. so. That uh, obviously, yeah. <laughs> Playing by uh, country's legal requirements is one thing. I, I think one thing that I saw um, from colleagues of mine is what they did with their pharmacies that I thought was interesting was their online presence was through social media and engaging their customer base through social media. Mm -hmm. So the pharmacy had a, you know, as an example, a Facebook page or a Facebook group for that community. And they were active members of the engagement of that community online. Because of that, it, it was sort of cemented that, you know, that pharmacist was within that community because of their interactions with not only face-to-face -face their customers, but in an online sphere. Now, moving to a space of if they need to set up, and I think I'm gonna put a great example, some things you just can't do by yourself and help is always great. But I think getting that presence, if you want for yourself in an online space, uh, social media can sometimes be a great space depending on you know if a lot of your customer base is already on there looking at where are they chatting where are they talking you know where are they uh, what are their likes dislikes and you can see that okay yeah wonderful so we can use uh, with the changing times with the advent of technology we can use the social media uh, for the online pharmacy that's an excellent suggestion uh, Ukamaka, would you like to add anything or do you have any experience in Africa? Uh, I, you, you need to unmute yourself, please, Ukamaka. Can you please unmute yourself? Yeah, it happens. Yeah, sorry, yeah, sorry about that. Yes, um, he's talking about individuals, how they can start online pharmacy. It depends on what is uh, obtainable in, in the person's country. If your country is companies that start retail uh, community pharmacies. Then when you want to do online, you use that same company to start the community, the online pharmacy. But for countries like her own, where it is individuals that register community pharmacy, then the online pharmacy should be an extension of that her community pharmacy. What she has to do is to ensure that she follows the rules and regulations that are guiding online pharmacy in her country. Then, as I said earlier in my presentation, she has to upscale herself. She has to build her capacity on technology, you know, to be both informal and formal um, and, and formal knowledge to be able to, to do it. Then in the areas where she will not be able to, 
uh, uh, to, to handle in that practice, you have to bring in other experts that are good in, in technology to assist her. But the important thing is that she has to do it in line with the laws of her country. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yes. Uh, there is another interesting question, how to ensure the quality and the safety of the medicines which we obtain online because there may not be uh, checks, quality checks on it. So I think this is more from the consumer perspective that uh, from where to order, how to order and the accreditation of internet pharmacies. So uh, it's open to all. So Jaime or Ardi, you want to answer this? Yes, I will go ahead. Yeah, uh, in, in the um, case of Spain, uh, I'm very proud to say that uh, the percentage of fake medicines in the legal form is exactly zero because uh, we have a very strict regulation, not only related to community pharmacy practice and ownership, pharmacies can only be owned by pharmacists and pharmacists can only own one single pharmacy, so no chains are allowed, are allowed uh, no corporates. Uh, in, that, in that sense, we are very careful with what we do in our businesses because uh, we respond legally with our, uh, with our, um, with our uh, uh, business. Uh, I mean, we are not companies and uh, the fines we pay if we do something wrong is limited uh, compared to companies, of course, have uh, limited fine, fines. So uh, as practitioners and also as pharmacists, uh, not only from our professional uh, perspective, we are very careful with what we do and the suppliers we get. Another thing that we have in place in Spain is retailers. Uh, they are also very much regulated. And for example, pharmacists, uh, pharmacists as technical directors, which who also respond personally if there's any uh, fake medicine uh, being supported uh, through them. So we have a very strict regulation. Of course, we have uh, the internet, uh, which is an, an open field uh, for customers. And as uh, and RD said, uh, there are some advantages for them, but they're not really aware of the risks they are running. So um, we, uh, two years ago, the Union uh, enforced uh, uh, the fake medicine regulation for the, whole of the European countries. Uh, and then it's up to the countries to uh, adapt them to their own regulation. So, uh, for example, we have a data matrix code in each box that uh, allows uh, specific track and trace, track and trace, sorry, of each single box. So, the moment that when we uh, dispense the medicine, we dispense again. And uh, so, I think regulation and enforcement of that regulation is super basic. Great, wonderful. So the patients are in safe hands. Uh, Adi, do you want to add anything or? No, unfortunately, being in Australia, we do have similar tight re regulations like Spain, so there's not much uh, to add in regards to that. But I don't know if Ukamaka has anything to say. Nice. Yes. So, okay. Yeah. 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 Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I, I also, I also uh, want to advise that each uh, country regulator should um, should should educate their consumers or the public on where and where to get their products because the consumer will not be the one that is genuine or the drug that is not genuine. But the place where you source your products is the most important thing. So I think that Hello. educate their population premises because, because it's, a, it's, a, it's an issue of supply chain. When there is a, a proper supply chain, it is difficult for fake products to enter into the chain. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Uh, so we have seen the examples of the countries where are very strict regulations over the internet pharmacy, but in some parts of the world, the pharmacies, the online pharmacies do not even have the dedicated laws for it. So uh, as you know, in India, we don't have dedicated laws for the online pharmacies. I'm sure in some parts of Africa also, we don't have dedicated laws. So overall, uh, many uh, people have the impression that the law for e-commerce are ill-defined and they're subject to variety of interpretations. People may take different meanings from the laws and the rules. So do you want to comment on this? And there is also a problem with the jurisdiction. So the if I want to order something from another country, uh, then I may be able to do so. So uh, 
how can i mean these are the challenges in operating the uh, internet pharmacies so if uh, adi wants to say something yeah i think when you have jurisdictions where you know the laws may be ill defined i think you know as part of our ethics we don't want to break any laws but i would i would say if you're going to establish it in an maybe in an environment that may have a bit very interpretable laws seeking legal advice is one thing but also understanding your ethics as a pharmacist you know the law doesn't need to you know navigate you being a ethical pharmacist you have to be an ethical pharmacist part of your inherent characteristics so i i think like you know if you are going to if you are doing these things for the you know benefit of the patient benefit for the communities that you are in um it is navigating the laws and maybe seeking legal advice on what they might mean in terms of interpretation but just because it says you know the law may not say don't harm the patient you don't harm the patient because that's part of your pharmacy characteristics i think this is where the your ethical considerations are more important um and things that you should uphold as part of your own characteristics yes i agree with that so the ethics comes first whether it is an offline mode of uh, sell of medicines or the online because we are all for the patients and uh, patients need to get the safe medicines uh, so well said uh, there is one question uh, how the online pharmacy service can improve the clinical aspects of the hospital pharmacists who are offering bedside counseling on medication so this is a little different question taking us away from the community pharmacy to the hospital pharmacy setup haimi would you like to answer this Yes, um, I mean uh, we, we covered today mainly the aspects of supply of products, but there's the other part of uh, digital care, digital pharmaceutical care, and uh, this is a whole new world for us pharmacists. No matter the setting where we practice it, uh, of course, I'm a community pharmacist, and I'm my first person to talk uh, about hospital pharmacy. But my PE technology forum, both uh, Ardi and I, I'm ex- we are exposed uh, to uh, new developments, and I. quite a few of them related to hospital pharmacy and it's not new that, uh, uh, new technologies allow a, a better uh, supply of of the medicines in hospitals which can save a lot of money in expiries and stocking uh, many times with very super expensive medicines specialty medicines but also in the part of care not only internally uh, for example artificial intelligence knowing in advance when a patient is going to go sicker so you can provide care in advance before uh the, the patient gets worse which is very important and very efficient but also hospital pharmacists in some jurisdictions provide care to all patients so in those cases and again in spain we have many examples with hospital pharmacies here they provide telehealth services uh in some cases they use uh, wearables to follow up the patient uh follow up their blood pressure uh the uh, the metrics are automatically uploaded to a safe and secure platform at which physicians and hospital pharmacists uh have a look and follow up the patient so it's it's a whole new world and it's so convenient for patients because they do not have to go to a hospital they can be followed up many times uh in their convenience of their homes and that solves the majority of um problems with uh logistics regarding to care when they have to go to get an appointment uh skip uh skip their work it's it, this is changing uh the digital healthcare um uh, uh and also related to community that we can say almost the, the same and we need as you said manjiri very well we need to upskill ourselves and fip is doing i think a very good job with uh pharmacy schools and uh going forward into this right thank you so much i mean very well explained <clears throat> one quick question uh there are some countries where the e prescriptions are not common or there is uh, hardly any uh, mechanism to check the validity of the prescription whether the prescriptions are genuine and there are systems like uploading of the prescription i can maybe uh, do that on different websites online pharmacy website so uh, what do you suggest i mean is this a safe practice to when we cannot check the genuinity of the prescription uh, with online pharma i mean in this online space how safe is the patient yes i mean or yeah yes i'll be very brief uh, patients have to have the same um, guarantees 
as with a physical pharmacy. Uh, uh, online operations of medicines brings many advantages. Most of them, all of them are uh, stated by you, Kamaka. Uh, and uh, I think uh, pharmacists and pharmacy associations need to challenge governments because it's not for the benefit of the pharmacy, it's the benefit of the patient. Also the benefit of the healthcare system. And this uh, having people um, uh, uh, having fake medicines that's not good at all. It's very expensive uh, for the healthcare systems. And I'm very well aware of the problems you had in India uh, some time ago, uh, very big problems with this uh, legal framework uh, in India and the governments need to be aware. And uh, in this case, we have to be the best advocates, advocates of the patients uh, challenging our governments to, to, to produce the right regulation also for internet pharmacies, also for ourselves. Okay, well said. Uh, so the online pharmacies also do have uh, plenty of advantages, especially pertaining to the self-care. So do you see a lot of advantages for patients to reach out to the online pharmacies, internet pharmacies versus the other commercial outlets, the physical pharmacies? So self-care and online pharmacies. Adi, can you throw some light on that? I think... Um... I think the thing, this, the time I saw this probably the most um, uh, relevant was last year, where um, having access to my patients, you know, coming through the pharmacy shop was a lot less, and uh, you know, so, and you know, to conduct some of our medication reviews, how would I be able to do it without actually being to visit my patient? Um, so this was where I had actually we used a lot of um, online. Like the technologies to video conference a lot of our patients show me your medications how do you use your inhalers how do you use your puffers and allowed me to see them so knowing that you know part of our communication is verbal and non-verbal communication cues speak to them go through their medications with them but then allow me to follow up with them you know three months later to talk to them i felt there was a certain ease in terms of doing that for me because of instant access online uh, capacity gives you than having to organize a time to drive out to their home, visit them, and speak to them, where if I have you know, my schedule as my life and they have their schedule of their life, finding a balancing time was hard, where you know, the instant access of online meant that I could speak to them you know, from my home and they could speak from their home and we can chat. Just like you know, we have these digital webinars, that I feel like that instant access allowed patients to touch base uh, with their pharmacists in the first phase in an online space where they might have access to information. I think that instant access allows them to, you know, get their journey to a desired state a bit uh, optimized in a way and easier than if they wouldn't have it before. Or where would they go is the question. How would they do it before if they don't know? Yes, well said, yeah. Thank you. So we are, uh, we need to wrap up this uh, panel discussion. Very interesting. Uh, thank you all, uh, all the panelists. Uh, so we had uh, for last one and a half hours, uh, one and a half hours, we are discussing about the online pharmacy. We had excellent presentations and the deliberations in panel discussion. Uh, I would like to say that the online pharmacy world is evolving. I mean, the last two decades, we have seen the online pharmacies coming up and uh, Pharmacies have always adapted to the new technologies. The last three industrial revolutions, pharmacies have readily adapted to the changes. And the same case with online going forward. So the online pharmacies are going to stay and uh, going to stay here. And they have a lot of advantages, a lot of some disadvantages too. What, it need, what is needed is the robust regulation uh, over the online pharmacies. So we are not risking the patient. Uh, from the by the misuse of the pharmacies, definitely when the online pharmacies function, there could be some disruption, and it happens with any new technology, and uh, def it can uh, disturb the pharmaceutical supply chain. Uh, but as the world is evolving, and especially COVID pandemic has digitally fast forwarded us, we need to embrace the new technologies. We need to adapt to the new technologies and uh, see how we can add value. Uh, to the patient care services by using the digital help, by using the online uh, sale of medicines and the pharmaceutical care services online. I know it is not very easy 
Uh, there are no easy solutions for the independent pharmacists uh, in different countries where the legal framework is not very clear or not very robust to adapt to these changes. And there would be a struggle and maybe some transitional period, definitely. But uh, we will uh, have to adapt and embrace the new technology, definitely, but not at the cost of the ethics in the profession and the patient safety. Whatever we do, an online or the offline, the patient safety comes first and uh, pharmacists will have to consider that uh, definitely. So uh, having said this, these are some of like uh, key messages that I thought are important for all of us. And thank you very much again to Jaime, Adi and Ukamaka for wonderful presentations, making interesting, making our panel discussion very, very interesting and answering to most of the questions uh, that uh, people, uh, that our colleagues had from world over. And thank you very much to FIP headquarters for all the support for organizing this uh, webinar. Thank you, Mila. Thank you, Zuzana. Uh, thank you, Ali and the team for successfully organizing the logistics uh, and supporting us throughout this webinar. Thank you, Sanofi Consumer Healthcare for supporting this. And uh, I would like to say, uh, Zuzana, can I have one of the last slides now? Mm, I would like to say thank you all the viewers from all over the world for all this, for your attention. The recording of this uh, episode will be available on FIP.org. Please write us the feedback uh, at webinars uh, at FIP.org so we may continue to improve our digital event offerings. We can always uh, uh, give you the contact details of our speakers if you write to us at webinars at FIP.org because some of our viewers had asked for the email addresses of uh, our panelists. So we can definitely do that. Please write to us at webinars at FIP.org. Uh, and the last slide, Zuzana, to conclude. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for joining us. Thank you again, all the panelists. And this is not the end of the online pharmacy discussion. We are going to have another interesting webinar coming up in uh, next two weeks, and that is on 6th of April. So see you next week on 6th of April for another webinar on online pharmacies. Thank you again. Till then, goodbye. Stay safe, stay well. Bye-bye. Namaste.